So this is my new pride and joy. This is a model of the Hubble Space Telescope. And it was made for me as a gift by my newly minted PhD student, uh, soon to be Dr. David Maltby, who passed his Viva with flying colors a couple of weeks ago. That means he defended his thesis against examination very successfully. And this is very special to me because, of course, the Hubble Space Telescope played both an important role in David's thesis, but has also played an important role in my own career. When we sit here on Earth, we are looking up through a very turbulent atmosphere of air. That's why stars twinkle, hence the song. So normally on Earth, we build our telescopes as high up above this atmosphere as we can. For example, the ones in La Palma are built at an altitude of several thousand meters above sea level, which is a good fraction of the way through the atmosphere. And so the air is still, it's not as turbulent, you're above a lot of the clouds, there's lots of benefits to building your telescope there, but you're still not all the way. If you build a telescope and put it into space, you remove all of these problems. We tend to measure telescopes in terms of their diameter of their primary mirror. The largest optical telescopes on Earth are now pushing 10 meters. We're planning a telescope that will be close to 40 meters in diameter. By comparison, Hubble's pretty small. It's only 2.4 meters in diameter in terms of its primary mirror. But what's so special is the quality of that mirror. That mirror was engineered to be so perfectly optically smooth that if you took this 2.4 meter diameter mirror, scaled it up to the radius of the Earth, the largest bumps on that surface would only be six inches high. It's an incredibly smooth, and well-ground mirror. Of course, the problem with it was... Five, four, three, two, one, and liftoff of the Space Shuttle Discovery with the Hubble Space Telescope, our window on the universe. Any of our viewers who remember when the Hubble Space Telescope was launched back in 1990 will remember what an utter disaster it was because they switched it on, they pointed it at some stars, and the images that came back were all fuzzy. And that was because as well ground as this mirror had been, it had been ground to slightly the wrong shape. It was too flat by two microns. That's 1 50th of the diameter of a human hair. And this tiny little mistake was enough to render this billion dollar space telescope essentially useless, at least in its early years. It was a huge disappointment and a huge public relations disaster, a huge waste of taxpayers' money. It would be dishonest of me to say this, the mood of the scientist is uh, very happy right now. We're all frustrated, obviously. One instrument where we have a major problem, of course, is the wide field planetary camera. Its prime science is gonna be done in the visible portion of the spectrum. Uh, we feel right now that there's probably no real science that we can do with the wild field camera at this time. And I'll stop there. But the thing about Hubble is that it was launched into low Earth orbit and it was always intended that it would be visited by astronauts. And so a few years later, one of five servicing missions went up to the Hubble Space Telescope and the astronauts essentially fitted a pair of glasses into the optics of the telescope to correct what we call this spherical aberration. And that corrected Hubble's vision and restored it to the really crisp resolution that was expected of it at the beginning. Hey! hey, 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 hey. One to the bright right picture. there. Oh! Oh, 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 oh. It is good for a few things. High resolution, really crisp imaging really detailed looks at very small areas of sky, whereas telescopes on the ground, we can build them bigger and bigger, which means we can gather a lot more light, and if it's designed in the right way, we can cover wider and wider areas. So we can survey huge patches of sky from the ground. We can't do that with the Hubble Space Telescope. But once we identify really interesting objects, we can go and follow them up and learn about them in detail with Hubble. It draws its power from these two solar arrays, so it gets its power from the sun. It has batteries that carry the charge. Um, but those servicing missions have been necessary 
to replace some of the very old technology. You know, we're talking about originally 1970s technology in the computers and in the batteries and keep it up to date. So it doesn't have an unlimited lifetime and it probably is expected to be shut down in the next couple of years.